Hei taas ystävät ja tervetuloa uusimman keskiympyrän pariin. Tällä kertaa matkaamme Seinäjoelle ja saamme vieraaksemme SJK skotlantilaisen päävalmentajan Steve Grievin mieheni, joka on nyt toista kauttaan SJK viime kaudella. Valmensi SJK Akatemiaa, ihastutti silloin kaikkia, nimenomaan tuo joukkue ja tietysti se tapa, millä Steve Grieve valmensi tuota joukkuetta. Nyt hän on edustusjoukkueen päävalmentaja, toki pienen mutkan kautta, mutta on sitä virallisesti tällä hetkellä. Ja nyt siis SJK on päässyt lentoon toki, nyt kun katsotaan viime kierroksilla ollut vähän ehkä heikompia tuloksia, mutta pelaa. Ennen kaikkea todella, todella upeaa jalkapalloa. Otetaan Steve Grieveä siis vieraaksi ja kysytään, että äh, miten hän on oikein päätynyt valmentajaksi. Hän on valmentanut ympäri maailmaa, ollut Sveitsissä, ollut Intiassa, ollut Kanadassa valmentamassa ja nyt sitten Suomessa. Joten miten hänen urapolkunsa on edennyt ja mitä hän ajattelee valmentamisesta ja valmentamisesta SJKs? Hi, how are you? I am good. How are you? Yeah, all good. All good. Um, it's it's uh, so nice to have you have you on the show. Uh, I'm, I'm happy we could do this. So, um, what's up in Seine, Joki? Uh, what what's the day been like? Ah, it's been fine. Obviously, we were training today, and all the players and staff are in for for a meeting because of uh, the post match that we always do on our first day back after the game. So we've been doing a little bit of um, scouting for the transfer window. We're still looking for one player, maybe two, but um, to find the exact profile we need is not exactly easy. So we still keep looking. If we find a player that we like, maybe we'll do something. But until then, we're, we're happy with what we've got. So it's been quite a busy day. I've actually just got in the door five minutes ago. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, in general, uh, we can go to specific later, but in general, how what would you say about this season, season with Asiko so far? Yeah, it's been it's been good. I think we're probably ahead of schedule in terms of uh, the consistency of performance and and how well we play. Obviously, we've got quite a, a strong identity as a team and how we want to play and and try and uh, kind of not dominate but to try and be as chaotic as possible in all phases of the game so it's been really positive obviously the the last game against Coops I think first half we were we were nowhere near the level we want to be but that's it's also the second time we've we've been unhappy with the first half against Coops so um and strangely it's it's maybe the only two halves that we've not been happy with all season so it's something we need to look into whether it's mental tactical physical something to do with the training week Maybe something to do with the preparation the day of the game or the day before. So, yeah, it's been it's been a really positive season. I think we've we've developed so many players really well. Um, the development of the team in terms of understanding what it takes to win. You know, it's, it's often a it's often a difficulty you face with such a young team, especially with so many in their first um, season at a top division. That. You can play well, but you can make small mistakes during the game, and that's what costs you points. And I think we've been we've been quite mature with those things. So it's been a work in progress, but I think everybody can be quite happy so far. Yeah, and of course, I I want to talk about Asiko uh, a bit later. But but first, um, I think still in Finland, people don't know who Stevie Grevy is. So so I want to talk about a little bit uh, about your career uh, because um, yeah. We don't know you that well, so so how did you uh, started coaching? I think you told at some interview that that you started when you were sixteen or something. You started coaching. Yeah, yeah, I started just before I was sixteen, and then I got my first paid job when I was sixteen. So um, I was working, I was coaching badminton for the first three months. I know when I said on the on the Finnish football podcast, I, I did badminton for the first three months, and then a job came coaching one of the football sessions and I was like the assistant to um, a guy called Steve McPhee and Christine Cook and that was good, it was good learning experience to just be an assistant and watch how to conduct a session and run it and do all those things and then um, I think maybe it was six months later I was like the lead coach for the three to fives and did the preschool classes which is the funniest group and then I did a lot of uh, sessions with five to eights so you learn how to teach in those classes. You, you're not, 
you're not doing a lot of tactical work. You're just learning how to teach like biomechanics, how to kick the ball, uh, gross motor skills, ball mastery, and then try to like develop a lot for the game. So you spend all your time doing that with the younger ones. I think I did that for, I think I did that till I was about 21, then I went to America. So yeah, I was when I was really young, I was doing a lot of different coaching. I was probably doing between 20 and 30 hours a week between the age of 16 and 20. So I gained a lot of experience pretty young. So I have quite a clear understanding of the different ways you have to try and try and be a teacher rather than a football coach. Yeah. Uh, what were the what were the reasons why did you want it to coach on and have have those reasons changed? Like if you look now what what you are doing doing on, on the football be, <laughs> see, see to be honest like uh, football coaching was like 10 10 pound an hour 11 pound an hour which yeah. like you know 20 21 years ago when you don't have many hours available um when you get paid like double or triple what normal 16 year olds are getting paid it was like well if i can do 20 hours a week at 10 pound an hour i'm doing not bad so yeah. Whereas I had friends doing 20 hours a week at five pound an hour. So I I just thought football coaching is, a, I know it's not a lucrative job now, but at 16, it was probably the best paid job. And it was something I think I'd probably a natural feeling for. Like when kids are coming asking you, like, how do you do this in a game? Because I was quite a skillful player. I would teach them how to do the skills and take them aside and then break the skill down into small bits and then layer it and things like that. So I had quite a natural feel for it. And I think that's probably what's kept me doing it for so long. But to be honest, at the start, it was uh, I heard that somebody else was teaching, I think, gymnastics or trampoline and they were getting paid 10 and 12 pound an hour. And I was like, right, I'm not working in the chip shop anymore. Two pound an hour. So we'll do we'll do that. That's a bit, that's a bit better paid. Yeah, but but it's not all about money now, right? <laughs> No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> yeah. So, and 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 of course, coaching and and also football uh, takes you to to strange places. You you've been in India. You've been in 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 Canada. I'm not sure if that's a strange place, but still all over the planet. So, uh, um, well, of course, you you were in 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 New Delhi. How did you end up there? Um. When I was working in Switzerland, the, um, the one of the co-founders of Bai Chung Butia Football Schools had read one of the books that I'd, I'd written and was published through World Class Coaching. Um, and then just coincidentally, his wife, or his girlfriend at the time, she was studying in Lausanne, where I lived. So he, he came to Lausanne to meet his wife, and then we went for lunch, which turned into like a four-hour discussion about how he wanted to build the, the best academy in India and how it was going to go from one city to every city in, in India and from I think at the time it was like 500 kids to 500,000 kids so for me it was quite an exciting project to try and take it from its infancy to try and build certain structures towards coach development player development um, tactical development to make sure that everybody has a very clear style of play how do you align all that across different cities a little bit of talent ID we managed to, towards the end, integrate like a analysis and analytics department, head of methodology, head of talent ID and um, data processing if if there was data available for players. So at the end of the three years, it was it was pretty well done. But at the start, it was basically just a meeting of me and Anurag and going through what his, his vision for the academy was going to be. And then I was quite excited by it at the end of... I was kind of at the end of the first season when I was working in Switzerland, I was offered a couple of jobs to stay in Switzerland, but I'd already agreed to go to India. So we went and it was, uh, me and my wife went, it was, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. And and one of the weirdest things I think, I think I, I read from, from Wikipedia that you also had a, you had a TV show. You were on a TV show called, called uh, Mind Game. So what's, what's I, that I, all about? This is the first I've heard to have a Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have. It's not long, but you, but you still have you you have it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so I'd been in India, I don't know, maybe nine months. I remember Sarah went back to Scotland. She went back to Scotland in January, and I got. I was taking a session in Noida, and one of the coaches asked me, he "says Would you want to be on TV?" And I was like, "Well, aye, why not?" 
I said, what's your actual job, Nikhil? And Nikhil was like the lead anchor for New Delhi TV, which is one of the big, biggest news organizations in India, which is massive. I didn't, I didn't realize it was Nikhil's actual job. And his best mate was the director and producer for yeah. 10 Sports. So I got a phone call a couple of hours later. I went for, I don't know if it's an interview or a meeting, but I took in a couple of the books that I'd wrote and just handed them to them and said, look, this is like some of my tactical work. Two guys sat and read the books for about half an hour and they said, can you start on Monday? So <laughs> started on the Monday. I had a four show contract and then four shows turned into one season. And then at the end of the next season or the start of the next season, they they invested in the Piero software to do the telestration on TV and then told me I was getting my own TV show on a Friday night. So it just snowballed into just a guy talking about TV and football on a TV on a Monday night to been in doing the Champions League the whole season, Europa League whole season, and then doing Monday and Friday shows as well. So, uh, yeah, I don't really know how to explain how you end up in TV in India, but that's just what happens. <laughs> All right. So now if you go back to India, does, does people recognize you on the streets? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. And I'm, also... a small, I'm a small white ginger guy. I'm sure I'm going to get looked at. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Um, also, also you were in you were in Canada. You were in Toronto. Um, so, from from India from, to to Canada is is uh, kind of a cultural shock or something. I don't know. Any anywhere to India is probably a cultural shock. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, to be honest, it was my wife's idea to go to Canada. Yeah, we we decided well, we decided we were going to leave India just after we got married and. We would try and go somewhere. I wanted to go to Japan, but I think it was probably a good decision to go to Canada. So, yeah, it's a, a lovely place. I knew the the technical director Kevin McGreskin. I'd known him for a while before it. He does the soccer IQ stuff uh, to do with like visual awareness and scanning gloves, cones, tennis balls, and stuff like that. It's mad ideas, but in general, it was pretty good. So, I went there. I was kind of like a director of coaching type job where. We have 7,000 kids in different levels of coaching, so it's about building a, an infrastructure for how everybody is to, to try and play and think and coach. And I think now it's, I still keep in touch with some people from the club, and even though I left in 2019, you can see the, the benefit of the work that's put in now because a lot of the players that were between 8 and, eight and 13, for example, they're now playing really high level within Canada and going abroad and D1 scholarships and stuff like that. So... You never really know how good the work you did was when you were there until way, way, way in, into the future. So the coaches took the ideas on board and ran with it really well. And like beautiful place to live. Burlington is, um, I think, is one of the best cities in Canada. It's such a lovely place to live. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think maybe one day we'll go back. But yeah, just a great place to go. Got my dog there. Had my first child there. So he's a Canadian passport. So yeah. Great time to create memories from it, and maybe one day we'll go back. Yeah. Um. How much do you do you want to study the culture where you at? How much do you want to to you know learn about the different countries, different cultures when you are, of course, coaching there? Yeah, I think if you, if you can understand the people and and the way that they think and understand their culture, it does make it easier to integrate. Obviously, like India is just so far removed from anything in western in the western world it's just completely different but um, even when you come to somewhere like finland finland's actually quite similar to canada it's a lot canada's a lot more capitalist and commercial and, and built up and that sort of stuff but i think fundamentally i don't think there's a huge amount of difference between canadians and, and finnish people so um it's just it's one of those things that when you go to a place you try and understand how people think and, and why they are and the, the way that they are but you obviously have to adapt your yourself and your own ideas and the way you operate around the people that you're working with because they're from a different culture and you have to fit into their culture not they don't have to fit around you so you have to try and work with them to understand how, how as you can cooperate properly yeah yeah so uh, after canada you were you were back in in uk and and doing some analyst work and and and, and scouting what kind of a period was was that for you yeah, it was good. I joined Dundee United as head of analysis. Um, I started coaching a little bit with under-16 team, but when you're doing analysis at first team level, it's just you can't do both. It's it's way too much, especially with the travelling involved. So I spent all my time coaching with the first team, 
uh, not coaching the first team, doing an analysis with the first team with Robbie Nielsen, uh, Gordon Forrest and Lee McCulloch, Neil Alexander. So working with three guys who'd played for Scotland and one guy who's coaching in MLS and coached at national team level in New Zealand. So it was a really good place to go and, and to work. Obviously, the, the objective when you go to somewhere like Dundee United is to try and be successful. For us, success was winning the championship um, and trying to go as far as we could in the Scottish Cup. But that was like not really a priority. We had to just win the league. I think Dundee United had been beating the playoff final four years in a row. So getting to the playoffs wasn't even viewed as success because it hadn't turned out to be the way it wanted to be. So we managed to get 15 points clear and then COVID happened. Uh, thankfully, we managed to get promoted in the end because there was no real way of stopping us from going up. We're 15 points clear. You can't vote us to not go up. Like yeah. We have to do it. So it's unfair on the clubs who were relegated. But at the same time, like unless you're going to restructure the leagues, I don't see a way you can do it. So, yeah, we, we get promoted and then Robbie leaves. We have Mickey Mellon joins. It was another interesting year. First year in the Premier League with, with the club for, for five years. And we managed to stay up. We got to a Scottish Cup semi-final and then I left in the summer. Yeah. Um. So now, of course, you you're you're wearing the the black and and gold. Well, not now, but but the kid is black <laughs> and gold in 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 Esieko. How did you end up in 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 Finland, Esieko? I think I can't remember what year it was, but when Tony left, Tony was assistant, and Tony went to Esieko. Yeah. Uh, it was a job posting and Keeney got the assistant job with Honsu and Richie didn't interview me for the job. I think he already knew he was hiring, but he messaged me after it and was like, oh, I didn't realise your coaching background was this strong. So um, we kept in touch ever since then. So I did a little bit of work in the background, helping with like strategy, recruitment, analysis, squad building, that sort of stuff. Um, and then when, when Brian left, I got a phone call just asking, do you want to go back into coaching? There's an opportunity here with the academy team. It's finished second division, but it's an opportunity. I'd just left Forest Green, so I said to my wife, look, it's, it's not an ideal situation for anybody, but it's an opportunity I'd like to take. And she supported the decision, so I've been here for, was it 15, 16 months, something like that. So it's gone well so far, but yeah, it's... Because I'd left Forest Green and I wanted to be a head coach, I, I was quite sure I would take the first opportunity that came. And thankfully, there was an opportunity in a club that I knew enough about. And it was a one of those jobs you could consider a safe job with people that you trust and you know that you can work with. Yeah. And and last year, as as we saw here in Finland, Asiko, you know, Academy was... was... You were really good in in Ukkonen and almost got got promoted to Veikkausliiga, which would have been funny to to have two as he goes. I'm I'm not sure if that would have happened, but but still, and uh, like like we know, you had a young team and you played really well. People were all people were saying that Asiko Academy is playing so well. So uh, why why do you think now, if you look back, why why was it that you were so good in Ukkonen last year? Um, I think that there was there was a decent amount of experience at the level for a young team. Like Dennis Kukichi, I think, has probably played about 100 games now at Ukinen. Yeah. But you had players like Marcus Arcelo, who, for, in my opinion, were Vegas League level players last year. Same as Salim Kasper came in from the Primavera and never played men's football. But you could see within a couple of weeks the, the quality that he had. Baba Karfati was the best player in the league. Like every time he played, you could see it was way too easy for him. Um, obviously, everybody thought Weslin was the best player. Weslin had probably the most amount of talent. So I think in in total, we had a a team that was ready to perform. It just needed guided properly and to play in an expansive way. Like Oli Gunes, you don't really want him defending, but you know in transition he can cause chaos because he can dribble by three people if he wants. Um, maybe if he adds some goals to his game, then you see a top top player there. But it's the team was already set to to do well. It already had one year experience or some players had played abroad. So the quality in the team was there. It just needed guided. We spent a lot of time um, trying to fix behaviours to try and make sure that every time you got the ball, you try and break a line, try and apply pressure on the ball, but actually worked more on compactness to make sure that we could just be solid defensively. And we looked at a lot of things to do, like picking up second balls, playing quickly under pressure, making sure that if teams come to pressure, how do you rotate? So we had quite a clear style, 
But the players were the players were better than I think anybody gave them credit for. And by the time the season finished, everybody knew. I, I think that last year we were the best team in the league. I don't think it was even close. By the by the season finished, we were better than A4, better than Nistan. So um yeah, we just had a an inconsistent start until the players realised that they were the best team. And I think by the end of the season we were just messing about with lineups and rotating players in and out and just trying different tactical ideas and introducing new players into the squad because that's the point of the development team. I think if we just played a proper team or proper shape and proper system every week, we'd have won all the games towards the end of the season. But we sacrificed some points here and there just to see how people would do in, in different situations as part of their development. Yeah, and, and as we know, as Esieko is maybe at this moment the best club in Finland if you think about the path from from academy or or junior players academy to the to the first team and also for for uh, coaches as well as as we can see you came from academy and now now you're in in, in the in the first team so uh, how do you see uh, does does Asiko do a good job on on that on on the development pathway yes that's what the foundation of the club is if you look at even like big terry terry was in the Ukinen for one year before he goes to the first team. So you give you give players opportunities at that level to, to go and develop and they come in. So I think if you look at other ones that have come through, like Noah Liner came through the academy. I think he was at Giko, then Hoyiko, then came back and played some games in the academy before going first team. Big Yeri's come through that system. Um, obviously with St. Puru from Hoyiko, but it's it's a club which is the foundation is built like developing young players. And whether we bring them in from other clubs and try and develop them or we bring them ourselves through the academy. Like we sold um, Ilari Kangas Niemi to Inter Milan um, in the winter period. He would probably be playing in the first team right now if we didn't sell him to Inter. But who's not going to who's gonna block the path of a kid going to Inter Milan? It's not something you can do as a club. We try and facilitate that. So, yeah, it's, of course, we sign a lot of African guys because of the, the EU rules. It's, it does help because the, the rules allow you to do it. Whereas you can't really do it with Brazilians or Argentines or whatever, so you can do it with loads of African boys. But we've done a really good job at bringing in Finnish players that have got the quality to to step into the first team. Like Thomas Coivisto has played first team this year. Um, Oki Vaisto has played first team. So we had two from last year's academy who are not first team regulars that have made appearances as well as like Casper scored six. Marcus has played well all season. Salim's played well. Fatih's played well. So. The foundation of the club is always going to be the academy. Um, the fact that they play in Ukes Liga, which is the second highest league, is obviously a testament to the work that's gone in for years before this point. Now it's just a case of maintaining our position within Nukas Liga and using that as the, the, the development platform that if players come in, they know how quickly the step to the first team is if they play well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to take one question from, from the chat. I have a chat here and, and there's a long question here. Um, when you took the role as a head coach uh, in SEECO uh, first team, you, you started from a different starting point compared to previous years with fewer experienced Finnish and foreign players and a lot of young players. How did you go about building SEECO's game identity knowing that you had many young players? Um, I think that the advantage of being the academy head coach moving up to the first team is that the existing first team players know what to expect because they've seen you do it with the academy. And then when you bring up six players from the academy, they also know what to expect. The difference is like ones like uh, like Rasmus coming in, I don't think he knew who the coach was going to be when he signed, um, but we had a clear identity. So we spent a lot of time designing training practices which inform the behaviours you want to see. And it did take about eight weeks to get it to a point where we were quite happy with it. Like in the League Cup, we were just messing about with different ideas and trying to give people some confidence and belief in themselves back, like Puru. Um, we, like I remember there was one game he was playing off the right and he kept dropping in to take it from the centre-backs because we wanted him to feel free in his position. So we could just play him as a number 10, but also if the right winger's taken off the centre-backs, that's not an orthodox move to make. But that's the things we would encourage him to do. So... We spent a lot of pre-season just building the behaviours and showing them that we have no position here. That's, where is the space? Go and get on the ball. All the training practices are not me telling them what to do. It's here's the idea. 
here's the constraints or the session design which leads to the objectives and then I go in and add value through coaching. So yeah, a lot of it is just constraints based or design design based training where you say, well, if we want you to play really vertical all the time, then you make a long and narrow pitch. If you want the centre backs to pass the ball forward all the time, then maybe you put goals in the middle of the pitch and the goal then the centre backs are the only ones that are allowed to score, which then facilitates forward passing. If you want the wingers to come inside and receive the ball in the pockets, maybe you create a strip of strip in the pitch where you can say, right, it's one touch everywhere else unless you receive it in this area of the pitch, in which case you can take as many touches as you want. So it facilitates them being able to move into the inside pockets and dribble. So we create loads of different practices where the, the behaviours that we want to see are encouraged rather than me just telling them what to do. And after a little while, they start to have their own interpretation about space and how many touches do you take. We do a lot of work on um, like non-verbal communication. So body shape, how does it, your shoulders dictate what you're going to do with it in advance, uh, positioning angles to bump the ball in and out of pressure, loads of work on third man runs. So don't actually do a lot of shape, to be honest. We don't have a shape within a game because we don't really do any shape. So a lot of it is just find the free man, find the third man, find the runner in behind and break lines. And training is aligned to that. If people came and watched training, you would see some of the quality and training is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, what kind of role does does the uh, maybe more older or experienced player have, like like Rasse Karjalainen and Tikkan and Jaime Moreno? Of course, they are they are the experienced players. So so how are you using them to to bring the squad together and 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 help the younger players? Uh, Rasse is probably the most vocal person in the dressing room, but I pulled I pulled Rasmus aside after he'd been in for a couple of weeks and said, look, I'm not going to be asking you to be the captain because I know you've been captain elsewhere, but I want you to be a leader and a voice within the dressing room. You're not going to be captain one, two or three because you don't need it, but we're going to come to you a lot of time to help guide this. So when we do post-match reviews, Rasmus is normally the first one to speak up. He always watches the games back. He always does his own individual clips with the coaching staff. He does a lot of work in the training pitch after training to work on his own individual movements and touches. So we use Rasmus quite a lot as a almost like an assistant coach, to be honest. Yeah. We use Tiki and Jaime quite often to organize the teams at training. So I'll give them the sheet with the names on it and they'll go and organize it. So they have a feeling, that, not a th- authority is probably not the right word, but a feeling of like, I need to take a leadership role here. So we allow them to take parts of the day's work to make sure that the players know who to who to look to for some guidance. But a lot of it is done in the video room. Like we use Jaime quite a lot for what do you think in the game and these sorts of movements. So Jaime just wants to get in the box and score. But you know that when pressure needs to be put on somebody's defence, that Jaime will lead the press and everybody looks to him to go and start it. Whereas Tiki's going to be the one that... It's been a big change for Tiki because he's always been in the middle of a back three stepping up, whereas now he's playing in the highest line possible in a back two. And... There was one game away to Pida where he's a pressing the centre back, pressing the striker all the way inside their box because we're trying to be super aggressive. And for him, that was like a big change. Whereas now, because he fully fundamentally believes in what we're trying to play like, he's going to be the one that's pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And he gets the other ones to buy in. So everybody buys in from the start because they can see it's going to help them. But when you've got Tiki and Rasmus pushing, like, we can do this. This is completely different, but we can all do this. When they're the ones pushing the boat in the right direction, everybody else just jumps on it with them. And to be fair to them, like they've been, they've been fantastic from day one. And every day their voice becomes stronger and louder within the dressing room. It's, it is a it's a big help to the coaching staff because you want the players to feel like it's it's their idea and it's their style and it's their way of playing. And I think that they've taken ownership of it this season and we've pushed the boundaries as much as we can because those guys help facilitate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I I watch a lot of uh, uh, Liga because I commented the games, and I when I have time, I watch the games. For me, if I look Liga this year, uh, well, of course, it's super super tight. Anyone can can beat anyone, but but I think Asiko and Ilves are those teams that I love to watch most. You play the most beautiful game for me, that that I that I love to watch, and. Um, I, I remember this quote from from British uh, manager Brian Clough, who said that 
beautiful uh, football is a beautiful game and it needs to be played beautifully um do you do do you mind or um, i mean does it matter to you if you play beautifully or is it just about winning if you win you don't you don't no. mind about the way no no of course winning is the end objective because if you don't win you get fired <laughs> yeah. and and players want to win so you have to give them the best choice to win for me i always i always look at it from the perspective of a fan like i have to sit on the bench and watch this as well and the last thing i want is somebody to say oh man stevie graves teams are really boring i can't i'm not having that sorry not having it so i have an influence on what people get to watch and i remember actually first or second game at the academy i actually said to the players look if there's one thing that people remember this team about is entertainment next game we beat a kappa 5-3 and it could have been eight yeah. but and the players were like right okay this is what you like they thought i was going to go nuts because we conceded three goals no don't care we go all out to play all the time even after the latte game we're all disappointed at the score but we scored five it could have been 12. so again one one five five same thing still a draw we didn't win we're disappointed but we could have scored so many more goals so for me it's more about what does the product look like do the fans want to come and watch this team um if you look up in the stand and there's fans on their phone boring if you look up in the fan the stands now the fans are never on their phone they're watching the game they're invested in it and i think you know the way that we ask the players to play they enjoy and they enjoy that it's entertaining and when you show them the clips back after the games and you look at the good attacking play and a lot of the time they're just like wow how good are we so it's yeah it's good to watch Yovez are the same Yovez are, are really good to watch and i think that the way both of our teams play are actually really well set up for european games and that's ultimately what you want is to try and be successful get into europe and then continue your style and if you do that then the the benefit is that maybe you're more successful but the second part is you get to play a small part in players progressing in their career to a higher level and that's also a nice thing to see yeah yeah um here is also a, 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 another question greetings from tampere uh, and uh, following you tv in twitter i've noticed you're firmly against var as most as most of us are has there been any discussing within asico or with other organizations about the introduction of var in finland in the finnish cup and in future i'm worried they'll just force it through without asking opinions from players coaches public etc there's been no discussion with me because it's above me it would go way 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 above there's nothing that i can do about it um I, i don't know if i should say publicly but most people know that i don't like it i think it goes against the essence of what football is we're trying to americanize sport and slow down the process people love watching football because it takes 96 minutes you watch a basketball game and it takes three hours it's, so it takes away from the game second thing is what i will say is we would probably be the team that benefits the most from var of all the teams in the league this season we've had so many bad decisions go against us and we try not to complain about them but i'm going to bring them up we've had multiple penalties which are not penalties given against us multiple teams have had multiple penalties given for them which were also not penalties and it has a direct result in the league table so financially it has a big impact on many clubs so i could say oh yeah i'm completely for var because selfishly it would help us but fundamentally i think that the referees do a difficult job pretty well they make mistakes so the coaches so the players but when you're in the stadium and you have to and you score and you've got that um instant everybody's cheering and going mad and all that stuff the emotion is taken from the game because we have to do this 30 second check to check for a foul that happened 40 seconds ago on the other side of the halfway line so unless it's blatant and clear and obvious i don't see the need for it and there's many leagues that are totally against it you've had fans protesting against it in multiple countries if we bring it in we bring it in it's in line with global standards fine but it doesn't mean that people can be completely for it and unless it's like instant snap decisions and it's done and it's as close to automatic as possible then there's always going to be issues with it so yeah we have it fine 
but I would prefer not to have it. And I don't think I'm saying anything controversial by that because I don't think I'm saying anything that other coaches also don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Um, so, what do you think about this year's league? Obviously, last year you were coaching in Ukkön and Ukkösliiga, and and now in Veikkausliiga. This is, like I said, anyone anyone can beat anyone, and 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 it's so tight. You're you're in the championship race, so so. Is that the target now? It has. It has to be. That's what the target. When in the league? Yes. Okay, I'll ask you a question. What would you have said that our finishing position would be at the end of the season in April? Um, that's a good question. I I don't remember, but I I think it was somewhere in top six, maybe fourth, fifth, maybe something like that. I had I had a lot of people saying seventh, eighth, yeah. ninth. So, like, does the expectation change because we've improved as a team? Of course it does. Of course, we've shown that we can do more. Are we trying to fight for the title? Aye, so is everybody. You know, if we if we win five games in a row, then, you know, we're on 47 points and that usually gets you into Europe. So our points target and our goals target and our goal difference target and all the analytic targets, we're, we're hitting on a weekly basis. So... We focus on those targets. We don't focus on, you know, I think maybe last week was probably the first week where we actually looked at what the outcome of a game could be and what the league table could look like. And I think it probably threw off our our focus on just doing the process right and getting the basics right. So um, we don't really talk about it. How many points can we get? How many wins can we get? Our target was 15 wins. If we get to 15 wins, then we're going to be top three minimum. And that's all our focus is going to be on because... Um, we probably spent too much time looking at the league table last week thinking, well, if we win, maybe we're top of the league and we can go for it. It's, you know, I think Ilves are playing Coops in the next couple of weeks. So yes. people are going to drop points again. Hoyko's got a few difficult games. People are going to drop points. It's, there's, there's 27 points to play for. So for us, I think we can get to 59. It's probably looking like 53 will win the league. So. We need to make sure that if we are going to win the league, can we get to 53 points, which means we need another seven wins. So, so yeah, can, are we in the fight? Of course we are. But our sole focus is on making sure we achieve our targets over the season. And if we achieve our targets over the season, then we'll be in Europe. Yeah. So so what are the biggest th- things to develop now in your game? As as we know, you can you can be the best team in the league. We, we've seen it already, but but you can also drop some points. <laughs> Stop! Stop giving away so many penalties. <laughs> yeah, maybe VR will help with that. Um, no, on a more serious note, yeah, stop giving away so many penalties is the first thing. Second thing is like, can we can we increase our conversion rate? We take the most shots per game in the league, um, but our conversion rate and our shots on target are kind of middling. So, if we can get our shots on target rate higher, then that would. That would help our conversion rate and would help us maybe score three or four more goals by the end of the season than what our current projections are. So if we can get that right, that would be good. We need to probably complete more passes into the box a little bit more often. I think sometimes on the edge of the box are a little bit um, overly risky, but we're quite happy to put the ball in, especially in certain moments. But I think there's there's times where we could maybe feed a ball into feet inside the box rather than um, try and feed it in behind. So, But then again, we, we try to hit certain areas, so it's maybe not... Uh, Ilves hit the most amount of passes into the box in the game and we're slightly below that because we play a slightly different style. But yeah, if we could complete more passes into feet inside the box and that might give us more touches in the box, which might lead to more shots and then hopefully more chances to score. But yeah, we if we can get that right, I think also like when we when we go to press, we could be a little bit more uh, not adaptable because we can press in four or five different ways, but how we press against different shapes and systems and what spaces that we're willing to leave to try and get a little bit more pressure on the ball. So, yeah, if we can get the press right and a few more like passes into feet inside the box a little bit more cleaner, then I think those would help. And if our shots on target percentage was goes from, say, 34 to, to 40%, that would be a massive help. So, again, it's more just looking at what are the small details that are going to make the biggest difference. Yeah, yeah, and also one thing I want to ask you that, like like you said before, you're you you're playing beautiful football, entertaining football. Uh, 
what kind of feedback are you getting from from the fans from people from Seinäjoki? Do they do they speak you in the grocery store or or of course at the stadium? But what kind of feedback are you getting? Um, I had one guy stop me in S Market the other day, and he says that he came around to me. He was so excited, and I was I was a bit like still annoyed from the game. He yeah. said, and so it was after the Latte game, and he says, "I know that you're not happy with the draw, but that was the best game I've ever watched." <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, but then even even in the bar after the game, we went up to the Carlsberg bar, Carlsberg bar after the game, and so many fans were like that was amazing. We drew five five with Latte, and of course everybody's disappointed we didn't win. But the general feeling was this is this is one of the best games people have ever watched. So we get this all the time, whether we win or whether we draw or lose, whatever. Like the overwhelming feeling from the fans is that this is this is the most exciting football they've watched in years. And I think I, even even if I ask myself at the start of the season what do I want to achieve from it, is that the fans love what we, watching what we do, and we can fill the stadium. So. Hopefully, we can get a few more bums in the seats and fill the place a little bit more often. But yeah, I, I do get stopped in the street. People say how good it is to watch. Um, that's that's and nobody ever mentions like, oh, that wasn't good, or what do you think of this player or that? They always just say, great job, love watching the team. And I think that's all you can ask for is that people enjoy coming to watch and they have this feeling of excitement to come back again the next game. Yeah. Uh, so. Are you enjoying your time in in Seinäjoki? What do you, if you have a spare time, what do you do? <laughs> I live in the town center, so sometimes I go for a walk around the town or up to the river. But most of the time, like I finish work quite late, I come home, I'll call my wife and kids, and then I'll go to the gym. You know, after that, at like nine ten o'clock at night, and then do the next day. So most of my life, most of my life is revolved around uh, working. But maybe if I Maybe if, every time I get a few days off, I go home. So if we get three or four days off, I'll I'll go home, see the wife and kids, and then come back. So, or they've come to visit, and we've gone to like Tampa and Helsinki and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it's been nice. I enjoy it. It's a nice little town. It's quiet, um, but we're here to focus on football. I think that's why people come to Zeni. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the biggest thing you you miss from home? Of course, your family, but anything else? My dog, oh. <laughs> wife, kids, dog. Yeah, like I live in a farm at home, so we live in the middle of nowhere. It's really peaceful and quiet. So, kind of, it's. I'm not saying saying the okay's loud, but I live like fifty <laughs> yards from a nightclub, so yeah. it's fine. It's fine. I can sleep for an earthquake, but yeah, I just miss the wife, the kids, and the dog. That's that's the worst thing. But yeah, do you think you will? Bring your family in in Seinäjoki or or what do you think? No, no. My my oldest one he starts school on next Wednesday, I think, fourteenth, I think it is. So he starts school next week, and the youngest one starts nursery the week after. So no, we're not going to move the move the family over. Um, they they just start school. So yeah, my okay. wife, kids, dog, they'll stay in Scotland. I'll I'll be. I'll be here for a couple of years. All right, all right, uh, sounds good. Um, uh, of course, uh, now you're totally focused on this season and as you go. But but I always have to ask about the future. What are your maybe dreams or or what do you want to achieve as a as a football coach, a manager? Just to try and get to the highest level possible. Quite like to be the Scotland coach one day, but I'm 37, so that's probably like an hour 20 years away. So maybe one day I can I could coach Scotland and go to a World Cup. That would be nice. But just to try and get to the highest level possible and enjoy enjoy what we do along the way. You know, play nice, exciting football and develop players that go on to have careers at the, the top top level, like the Champions League and stuff like that. So yeah, for me, I always just take it one day at a time, one step at a time. It's never. I'm not trying to think too far ahead. It's. You know, you get the odd phone call asking you some questions, but I always say the same thing. Like, I want to try and and win and say, okay, and maybe win a trophy here. That would be great. Whether it's a league or a cup, that would be great. But there's um, I don't know if you've ever been to the stadium. There's a there's a wall in the Carlsberg Lounge with millions of pictures. Yeah, I'd quite like to be in one, but I think that you have to be quite highly regarded in the club to be on one. So, um, 
maybe if I have a good season, I can get one picture on the wall and that's me happy. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um, also, someone said on on X on uh, Twitter that that you should be the next uh, Finnish national team coach. <laughs> I cannot speak a word of Finnish. <laughs> That's I all right. If you up. if you can coach, it's, up, <laughs> yeah. If you can coach, it's it's all good for us. <laughs> maybe maybe one day, but right now I think there's probably four or five Finnish guys that would be way ahead of me in the queue if that ever. Ever came up. Ken Ever's done an amazing job, by the way. I think sometimes some of the stuff you see written, it's it's crazy. You know, Finland get to a, uh, a European competition and, and do reasonably well, and some of the young guys coming through that have come through the 21s, and there's a new coaching staff. So I think the new coaching staff are all high level guys like Honsu and, and Timo Tainio and stuff like that. So I think um, as long as they continue to do well, then then fantastic and. Hopefully we can get a couple of players in the squad and maybe if I'm 45 and they're looking for a new coach, then maybe I'll talk about it. But right now, I don't think they'd even look at me. <laughs> maybe maybe at some point. Let's see. Let's see. But yeah, I agree. They're they're doing a good job there. And of course, we want them to go to the next Euros or World Cup or whatever. Uh, but but yeah, we're, we're starting to wrap this up. But uh, I want to ask you have a, a huge game coming the next game is is the Pohjanmaa derby against VPS. Um, so you've you've experienced the derby before, but but what are you expecting now? Um, obviously, we drew one one in the first game, and I thought we we deserved to win. We were a little bit unlucky with it, but it was one of those games where at the end it could have gone either way, and there'd have been a draw, and then we won five one in the cup. So I know that. You know, it was probably wasn't their full team out. They were missing Ahiabu and Justiniano, and they made a couple of subs at half time. So, yeah, it was it's probably a different type of game from the cup game. It'll be a proper derby. I hope that's what we're here for. We nobody, nobody signs up to be a coach to play in the games that nobody gets excited for. You know, <laughs> big games, big derbies at home where there's a, where there's a little bit at stake. They're the ones that you look forward to. So, yeah, we look forward to the game. It'll be difficult. VPS are one of those teams that are so difficult to break down. They play like. 5-3-2 low block man to man they try and get up and press now on the edge of your box and try and make it really difficult for you so if you have to play long they can be really physical from behind they've got three or four players with a little bit of chip in their shoulder so it's, uh, it's always an enjoyable one I've coached against them uh, once in the league cup one friendly one league game and one swoman cup game and I think they've all been good games so we look forward to having another good game and make sure we, we do as much as we can to win the game Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And let's hope the the audience is is the the stadium is packed. Let's let's say it like that. Yeah. Full crowd. Get everybody behind the team, and hopefully we'll come away with three points and back into a good feeling again. I think the last time we lost a game was like two months ago, and the last time we lost a game before that was uh, was a long time. So we've lost, I think, four games all year. So we need to just continue being on a, a positive mindset and. If we can do that and we stick to the things that we've been good at all season, then then I don't see why we can't go on another run between now and the end of the season. Try and make it interesting. Yeah, sounds good. Hey Stevie, uh, thank you so much for for being on the so show. It was it was great to talk to you, and I really hope that I get to commentate maybe maybe a few of your games this year because uh, five five is is really good for a commentator as a game. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know how many more of these are gonna have, but. Maybe we'll see. We've had a three-three. We've had a five-five. Let's, yeah. let's see if there's a four-four somewhere. All right. Okay. But hey, thank you and and have a nice evening. And now now you can go and call home. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you too. Have a good evening. Thank Cheers you. Bye bye. Thank you. Iso kiitos vielä vierailusta Steve Greeville. Sieltä saatiin Scotti aksentilla mielenkiintoista asiaa. Toivottavasti saitte aksentista kiinni. Meikäläisellä meni hetki, mutta hyvin sen jälkeen ymmärrettiin, mitä sieltä tuli. Ja on upea persona, upea valmentaja. Mielenkiintoista kuulla hänen ajatuksiaan jalkapallosta ja valmentamisesta. Ja ehdottomasti SIK on Tällä hetkellä yksi Suomen viihdyttävimmistä jalkapallojoukkueista, joten vahva suositus sille, että menette katsomaan SJK-pelejä, jos suinkin mahdollista. 
Tässä oli kaikki keskiympyrästä tällä kertaa. Nyt ei muuta kuin oikein paljon kiitoksia seurasta ja palataan jälleen ensi viikolla asiaan. Moi moi!